Hello, everyone. This is David Cease at Practical Catholic. All nations should be ruled by Christ. There was a period of time when most European nations were Catholic nations, but since the past 300 years, we have seen the segregation of religion from nations. This idea that democracy or real freedom in a nation can only be brought about by nation segregating itself from Christianity. We have this idea that a religion is a personal choice and should never be imposed by the state. But we actually need to make Christ king and ruler not only of our lives, but of our nation. Today's episode is about why having Christ as king will bring true freedom, peace, and prosperity to a nation, and why we need Christ to rule over us as king both personally and nationally. This weekend, we will be celebrating the Solemnity of Christ the King. Welcome to another episode of Practical Catholic with David Cease. Practical Catholic is a spiritual coaching show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, to become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. My story begins um, almost, uh, I can't believe it, almost eight, uh, eight years ago. I had gone on a pilgrimage to Rome, and it was a beautiful pilgrimage. It was with the Franciscans of the Immaculate, and uh, our uh, the pilgrim, uh, our, our priest that, that led it was Father Johannes, and he did a great job of having us stay at convents and um, priories. So not only was the cost of the travel very cheap, but uh, we got to stay at some beautiful churches and got behind the scenes. Uh, it was it was very beautiful. We were there for three weeks. Imagine just uh, gallivanting around uh, Italy for three weeks. And I had brought my two sons with me, my two older boys, Joseph and Joshua. And so um, this one time uh, we went to Rome and uh, we visited the, uh, the St. Peter's uh, Basilica. And you know, uh, I'm going to tell you two stories. One is kind of you know uh, funny, and the other one is more a uh, part of this this uh, this episode. Well, the funny part was that uh, I was uh, going through, and I brought my camera, and it was a video camera, and I was you know, I was able to go into the Sistine Chapel. Sometimes they close the Sistine Chapel, and uh, if you know anything about that chapel, it's where. Uh, the the uh, cardinals come together and are locked into that chapel to vote for the next pope. And uh, up in the ceiling is a beautiful uh, painting of um, basically hell, purgatory, and heaven. And the purpose of that is that the cardinals will be meditating on um, on that, that what their decision, how they're going to cast their vote, will determine the next pope and that they will do it uh, according to God's will. Because if you know anything about church history, there were a lot of political plays, even amongst cardinals, trying to get uh, their pope in as being the pope. So um, so I'm going in there, and I'm videotaping it, and I hear this guy saying, hey, you, turn off the, the, the video. And uh, I don't know why, but I just didn't think he was talking to me. And so all of a sudden, I see this hand coming right towards my camera. And before I know it, the hand is twisting it out of my hand. Uh, So and my kids are watching the whole thing. And they're like looking at me going, Dad, I can't believe that you were just videotaping. Can't you read the sign? And there's a big sign that says, do not videotape or take pictures in this room. Well, I didn't see it, but uh, it was pretty comical. So if you ever go to to St. Peter's, you will uh, know there's a big museum there, and uh, they have you know, lots of rooms. And uh, they basically, uh, I, I, at least I named the rooms, because the rooms have uh, themes, right? The Immaculate Conception Room, where everything's about the Immaculate Conception. But there were two rooms that really kind of um, was, was interesting. The first was I called the Room of the Heads. And uh, basically, it's all the statues of just the heads, of all the emperors of Rome um, in the olden days, and um, and they're on uh, their heads are on top of a pillar, and, um, and 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 there's tons of them. I mean, literally a whole room full of uh, these things, and it's kind of eerie because they're almost lifelike, and uh, they're just there with their heads on a pillar. <laughs> and uh, in in the olden days, you had to understand 
that they venerated, or not even venerated, they worshipped their emperor as a god. That's that's what they did. They they uh, they they really thought that the emperor was god, and so that's why they put this head on this pillar to remind uh, everyone that here's your god. You know, and um, it was very interesting to 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 know that and knowing Roman history and where that comes from. So then we went into the next room, another room, and I would call that the Constantine room. Uh, if you know anything about church history, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, was the first emperor to legalize, uh, um, you know, uh, Christianity. So he legalized Christianity, and uh, his mother was St. Helena. Uh, she was a wonderful woman, very devout Catholic, who brought a lot of great relics from Jerusalem to to uh, Rome. So he legalizes it, and there's this beautiful picture. And and unless you really realize Roman history, you won't realize the impact of this picture. But there's this beautiful picture of um, a pillar, one of those pillars where a head would be, right? um, And instead of the head being on top of this pillar, it was the cross of Jesus Christ on top of the pillar, and on the bottom of the pillar is the head of the emperor, which shows basically that it wasn't the emperor who was God, but Christ, and that he knocked over the uh, make-believe human so-called God uh, for him, because he was the true man and true God that was there. Beautiful. I remember just meditating on that and going, wow, that is amazing um, in doing that. So, uh, but there's a lot of other things I learned in there. So what are we going to be talking about is um, two things. Uh, You know, the topic of this title, I I called it, is what does North Korea and my son's career path have in common? Now, that might be really strange, the story of North Korea and my son's career path, Um, I had a beautiful conversation with my son a couple of days ago. It was a three-hour talk about his career path. and um, But there's a lot of commonalities between the two. And we'll talk about that. And what, what is a common thread here? The common thread is Christ as king, not just personally, okay? Not just personally, but he actually needs to be king over the nations, Last Sunday, I was uh, I went to my Senecal meeting, and uh, we we get educated by uh, Franciscans of the Immaculate Priests, and uh, so so last Sunday, Father Allen F.I. Uh, Franciscan of the Immaculate Priest, he talked about Christ being uh, King of the nations, right? We we are taught. You know, we have this like a uh, brainwashing idea that democracy is the true. Um, how can I say this? The best way or the the, tr- the form of government, but in reality, it might or might not be. Okay, and you know, um, why isn't communism good? Why isn't socialism good? You know, it's it's not that socialism is actually bad. If you Look at socialism, okay, there's really nothing innately wrong with it. I mean, it actually has a very, very good um, uh, purpose, right? Now, who doesn't want to be taken care of? Who doesn't want to be provided for? Free health care, free food, free whatever it is. You know, why do we have to pay for things like that? You know, why can't we just have it on our own? Why can't there be a commonality, okay, of government and and of people, right? That's what communism was all about, commonality. Why can't we do that, right? So the goals and objective of socialism and communism, I think are in essence very, very beautiful and very good. In fact, I would even say that they actually imitate a religious order, right? A religious order is communist in a sense and practically socialist, right? Uh, when when a friar enters the religious life, when a man enters religious life or a woman does, they own no property. They're common with the group there, right? 
Um, even the, the, if, if you're the mother superior or if you're the father guardian of a friar, your, your tour there is only for about several years and then they turn and, and, then, and then you're back to the common people again and someone else does it. They know that it's just in and out. That's all it is. So everything is common. Everything is owned by the community, right? And no one is better than the other. So in, in essence, it's a very socialistic form of ruling. And um, so we can see that. We can see the beauty. And that's probably why it's so attractive, right? It's so attractive that people want that. And I, I think that's a great way of doing it. But why is it that communism fails? Socialism fails. But religious orders are successful. Okay? What's the difference? Okay? Why, why does, in essence, a religious order, which I believe is more a socialist type of an organization, or communist kind of an organization, works, but a secular form of that, socialism and communism, doesn't? And there's only one reason why. And that is because Christ rules underneath a religious order. That's why. Christ rules it. Okay? That's fundamentally the importance. Well, in the secular view of socialism and communism, the first thing they do that will actually make it successful is they kick God out the door. They think that they can do it without God, okay? But in essence, they didn't kick out God, you know, from... They just replaced God with themselves. That's what they did. If you ever study communism, Russian communism, um, they had a polar, you know, it was was an interim type of government. In theory, when communism took over, in theory, this interim government, you know, was supposed to only be there for an interim that was it. Nothing more, nothing less, and that's what it was for. Until um, the people who were forming this interim government became power hungry and realized they didn't want to give up the power because that power, the prestige, the money, the uh, luxury, all entrapped that person, right? Right? And so you had people like Lenin and Stalin, all these people who did everything under their son to keep in power. He, in fact, Stalin is known to have killed more people than even Hitler did, killing roughly 8 million of his own people. He would actually fire his cabinet. And when I say fire his cabinet, he actually literally fired them with guns. You know, a whole new meaning of firing, right? Um, he actually killed them, and he would start all over again with a new cabinet um, because he had this fear that they would be against him. You know, um, I would have that fear as well if I kept killing people um, every other year or every other time. So, so that's what happens. So it's not as though we uh, get rid of God. We just replace God with ourselves. That's what happens. Now, let's look at, you know, um, a religious order, all right? A religious order, the first thing it does is that it believes in, you know, God. And that the, the religious, let's say um, a man joins um, a religious, he acknowledges the full... Um, how can I say this? The full dominion of Christ. And he makes a vow, a vow, they call it the evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Okay? And that vow, okay, by definition, is a promise to God. That's what it is. Okay? So a promise is just a normal promise, is a promise from man to man, so from one person to another. A vow is a promise from from a man to God. A man is, or a woman, is saying, I promise to do this to God, okay? 
Um, that's why uh, a publicly professed vow, which a religious makes, can only be broken in uh, by Rome, because the Pope is the only one who has the full authority of, in essence, God, all right? Because he is um, uh, he is the vicar of Christ or in place of Christ, you know. Um, so no priest or, or or bishop can actually break that vow, except for the Bishop of Rome. So. So it's important, right? Well, that vow given freely helps that that uh, friar, that man, live that vocation of the evangelical council of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, why? Why those three things? Okay, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Poverty. Why poverty? Well, because it detaches that person from materialistic goals. You know, we look at the what are the three, three things that that's corrupt people, you know, they, it's always represented as, you know, money, sex, and power, right? Money represents materialism, you know, everything going after certain material, all right? Um, you know, luxuries, you know, design. Uh, sex or... Um, a vow of um, chastity targets pleasure. We seek pleasure, you know, out there. And um, the antithesis of that, of course, is is sex. Um, but there's other ple- pleasures like gluttony, overindulgences, and everything else that goes on that will, if in excess, will abuse other people. And then obedience. What does that conquer? Power. What's the opposite of power? Well, obedience, right? The lack of power, which you mean you have to be obedient. So that's what happens. That's why religious orders succeed, because in essence, they make a vow to put into check those things that make man want to become a god, that rule over and to dominate other people. Why? For money, for pleasure you know, for material goods, for pleasure, and for power. But you see, when communism or socialism eliminates Christ from ruling over, then our passions are unleashed because there's nothing telling us we have to control them. There's nothing. And especially if you rule and dominate, you will want to keep that power. And the way that you do it if you can't trust people, is to become controlling and Machiavellian, all right? That's really what it is. So if you look at many, many, many communist and socialistic countries, what happens? It winds up being controlling, domineering, and um, in essence, fear sets in, okay? Um, You know, in the past couple of years, I would say since I was probably uh, early 40s, uh, I started uh, um, researching my my heritage. So if you don't know, I'm actually Korean. And, um, you know, if you see a picture out there, I'm Korean. But I was adopted at the age of five by uh, a beautiful family, uh, half German, the one side, my father's German and my mother is Polish. So culturally speaking, I'm more Polish than I am, um, you know, Korean. So uh, in the past, I would say, what, seven, eight years, I have been researching more about my Korean heritage. And I, I've been sympathizing more and more with North Korea, especially the plight of of, um, of North Koreans into China and, uh, and, the, and the things that are going on. There are estimated about 300,000 North Koreans who are hiding in China um, and, uh, and, and being basically abused because they know that if they're found, the Chinese government will repatriate them back, back to North Korea. And that, in essence, is a, is a death sentence um, with torture. So, but why do I bring that up? Okay. I bring that up because I was doing some research on um, North Korea 
And uh, it was it was a good. There was a video by a uh, South Korean, not a North Korean, but a South Korean, and he basically argued the point that the West, meaning AKA America, will never know what it means to be a North Korean. Why is it that communism is not being challenged in North Korea, right? In North Korea, why isn't it being challenged? Well, it's not being challenged because this this South Korean um, uh, professor argued that it's because in Korea, which is a very uh, a Confucius type of a um, uh, community, um, they don't view uh, you know the North Korean leader as just a a governmental leader like Trump, right? Like he's just a politician that is the president. They actually view the North Korean leader as a god. Okay, it would be like. You know, he's both, not he's, you know, uh, you know, he's not only the, um, a, a political leader or a governmental leader, but he's the Pope, you know, he's, he's Christ to those people, you know? And so it would be very, very hard for them to fathom deposing a Pope or, 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 or even Christ himself. All right. He is a God for them. And so, they actually will suffer through them because they think he's this great leader, even though he's not, okay? Because as a human being, he's fallible. He makes mistakes. Even if he had the best intentions, he would make mistakes, okay? He's emotional. And most importantly, because he's, the government is atheistic, he has no control over his passions and no control over his behaviors. And because of that, the government spirals into this controlling environment. Okay. That's what happened. It spirals into this Machiavellian controlling environment. It's it's funny because the people in North Korea, as I was watching this documentary, are so fearful, they can't even express their feelings. They can't express, they're basically emotionalist because they don't want to express anything on the outside that might give away their inside. Imagine that. That's how controlling it is. They control what kind of haircut he has and those types of things that are going on. So there is a level of trust that is destroyed, completely destroyed, when God is taken off the national table. And you were seeing that here even in America, right? You know, what is perjury, all right? You know, with me being a devout Catholic, if I were to go to court and I make an oath to swear to tell the truth, okay, I will do it because I'm a Catholic. And I know that the true meaning of swearing an oath means that God is the underwriter of my truth. What does that mean? He's the underwriter of my truth. When we swear an oath, and I swore several oaths, right? I went to court and I had to swear an oath. But most importantly, I swore an oath to defend this country, okay? Or to die doing that. All right. The the an oath means that God is the underwriter, right? An underwriter is someone who says, "You know what? You might not trust, you know, my son paying back that loan, but I'm going to underwrite his loan. So if you don't trust him, you can trust me. Because if he defaults on that loan, I will pay for it." Okay? Well, that's what an oath is. As a Christian, we believe that an oath says you might not believe that David Cease is, is telling the truth, but I'm going to underwrite that. I'm putting my name attached to him when I swear this oath. And if David is lying, justice, even though you might not know it, justice will demand that he pays for it after he dies in a place called hell. All right? So 
And that's my conscience. I know that. If I should lie and I swear an oath, I am taking the Lord's name in vain. It's one of the Ten Commandments. All right? And I, that is a condition for me to go to hell. So there is this idea that we can um, trust someone. Christianity brings this level of trust. But if perjury can't be defined in a religious context, then what happens is they start creating more and more laws, more controlling laws to enforce perjury. And that's what we see. The consequences of perjury is escalating higher and higher and higher to try to threaten people that we will will, uh, enforce this perjury, okay? Um, You know, uh, I think we all know about the incidents about these people who uh, bought their children into these these, um, colleges. I don't know the whole stories of this because I don't watch the news that much. But I know that one of them is holding out and saying that they're innocent and they didn't do it, even though they did. And so what are they doing? They're throwing more and more ridiculous, you know, uh, charges against them to make them, you know, say to them, hey, we did it. Well, why? Because when you don't have a level of trust based off of religion, then it winds up being a house of cards. Okay, so the, you know, one thing that I want to talk about right now is, you know, the spiritual versus the material, all right, spiritual versus material. One of the concepts that people have to understand is that things like love, hate, patriotism, trust are not tangible, okay, and they're hard to enforce materially, right? Think about this. Spiritual concepts like love, hate, patriotism, trust are not tangible and hard to enforce materially. And I'll give you a couple examples. When, um, you know, Poland has only been, uh, you know, recognized, or I shouldn't say recognized, Poland is a unique nation because Poland has been dominated by other countries and they dominate other countries, but they've only had their freedom for now 70 years, okay, um, because right before, I believe, World War I began, they got their freedom and their identity. But Poland has existed even when people conquered them. Why? You see, because countries that conquered them could not make them non-patriotic, non-Polish. They just brought their culture to the underground and they kept their Polish culture in the underground, even though they try to do as much forcing as possible. Okay? In the past week, we've been reading the book of Maccabees. All right. And if you if you study the book of Maccabees, what are all these nations doing to the Jewish people? They're forcing them to eat pork. They're forcing them to eat sacrificial meat against their religion. But they don't do it. Okay? Because a spiritual concept can't be beaten out of people from a material sense, okay? You can't, you know, beat trust uh, through material ways. Trust is a spiritual concept that people will either do or not. Same thing with love, you know? There were plenty of girls when I was in high school that I thought I loved them. But I cannot make them love me, okay? People hate me. I can't do anything about it. It's them, okay? So these are spiritual concepts that we cannot enforce materially, but it happens to people. And because of that, a lot of times, people who want to be controlling and empower will try to use material goods to try to support, to change their spiritual behaviors, and that will not happen, okay? You can't do that. So um, I was reading about North Korea and how, you know, they, they don't even enforce love, okay, and emotions. They have zero emotions in North Korea, only fake emotions based off of always being happy or sad depending on what the leader is doing, okay? So 
we have this this I you know we have these spiritual concepts that can only be enforced spiritually. Spiritually, this is why we have spiritual exercises. This is why we have the Catholic Church. This is why God gives us the grace to help us spiritually to love, you know, to trust. This is why we need God to rule our nation. Because a nation that, that eliminates God as its ruler will make other human beings, its leader, a god. And that is the fundamental crux of society. It goes all the way back to Genesis with the serpent. If you eat the knowledge of the tree of good, you will be like God. And the irony of it is God wants us to be God, right? He wants us to be his children, which is in essence being a God. We are divinized when we become a child of God. But we don't want to be a child of God. We want to be dominant and replace God like Satan wanted to do. So this whole idea is played out throughout time. And if you read the Old Testament, you can see that happening. You know, the first instance of that is the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is built... He brings people together to build this big tower to what? To basically say, I'm better than you, God. And as time goes on, the Israelites represent the people of God, and all the other kings represent the people who want to replace God with themselves. And that's basically what happens. Every ruler that is not in the Israelite uh, tribe, you know, they are believe they're gods, right? And they try to enforce that amongst the Jewish people. And that's why there's this great animosity, because the Jewish people will always say, no, you're not God. God is God. The real God is God. And not your king, not your emperor, okay? And now we see it playing out even outside of the Bible, throughout history, that has happened where the emperor, it wants to be God. Okay. Have you noticed why Hitler says hail Hitler with the Roman people? They say hail Caesar. And why do we say hail Mary? You see, we want, everyone wants to play God and every nation becomes God. If you look at (coughs) communism, socialism, That's exactly what happens. And the epitome of that is North Korea. North Korea, Kim Il-sung is not only a leader of North Korea, but he's also a god to them. That's what it is. And when that happens, they become controlling. That's what happens. Have you noticed that when socialism enters, there's so much legislation and government and rules. Why? Because they want to be controlling. (coughs) So, which means that you truly lose freedom, okay, when you come down to it. Now, in America, we actually have an opposite problem, all right? We have this problem called license versus freedom, okay? Remember, we talk about... um, you know, uh, a virtue being in the center. So we, in essence, fall under the far left. If North Korea falls on the far right where it's controlling and you can't do anything, then America has a problem where we fall to the far left. And in the middle is true freedom. The far right is controlling. The far left is license. And in the middle is virtue, which is called freedom. Freedom is the well-balance between license and control. So in America, we are falling on the far left, which is license. What is license? License means I can do whatever I want to, whether it's right or wrong. And in this case, we threw God out the door in ruling our nation so that we can do whatever we want. And phrases like pro-choice, 
academic freedom, free thought, all of these things is the definition of license. That's what it is. It's not freedom. It's license. Pro-choice means I can, I can do whatever I want to my body, including killing the child inside of my womb. Academic freedom says, you know what? Uh, education isn't to form a person. It's supposed to educate them even on things that are evil. There are evil things that we should never be willing to see nor want to have as an example. And yet, that's what academic freedom is all about. We should allow people to see the evil and be educated in those things because, you know, they'll know more. And if they know more, then that will empower them. And that is not what it is. Education is a formation. And what is that? It's a total formation of a person who is gearing themselves for the purpose of, of doing God's will. And yet you have Catholic universities promoting this academic freedom and destroying kids' innocence and their soul you know, during that process. And there are plenty and plenty of, of Catholic priests who are presidents of Catholic universities who promote this, who promote this, and they do not take the oath of allegiance academic allegiance to Rome. So this license, what is it? So in America, we promote this idea of license, and you're seeing it more and more and more. You know, as time goes on, we're allowing things to happen. We're starting to legalize marijuana, starting to legalize other recreational drugs. Now, you know, I'm not this Machiavellian thing, but there are certain things that we shouldn't be doing. We legalize killing of innocent children. This is falling under the law of license. And now we have same-sex marriage. We're redefining marriage. We're redefining everything that is that needs to be redefined. Actually, not needs to be redefined, but they can redefine. Okay? When that happens, there is no truth. And when that happens, you can't trust. Because in this case, how can you trust something when you keep redefining it? There's no, uh, it's, it's a house of cards. It's a house built on sand. That's what happens. So we are on the opposite here. So if North Korea is on the one side controlling, here in America, we are going out of control. Uh, a pope, I forget which one it was, in the late 1800s wrote, uh, a document, and he said the problem with America is, I think he called it Americanism, and Americanism is making freedom a god. That was a definition. Making freedom a god. We made freedom a god to the point where we cannot control it because we've now become uh, a way of license. You know, we can do whatever we want. Okay? Hey, he's not hurting anyone. You know, he can do whatever he wants. And so that is where we are. So the other thing I want to talk about is when we think about um, God ruling our nation or governing our nation, Satan does an excellent job, okay, of, of really making it sound like that Christ's dominion over, over a nation is really the Machiavellian, is the one that's controlling, right? And it really isn't. I always tell people, God only gave us Ten Commandments, okay? There's only Ten Commandments. That's all it is. You know, everything else comes from um, man, you know? If you even look at, uh, at the Old Testament and the Jewish laws, if you look at the Jewish laws, and they have plenty of them, I think it's like 645 laws, Those laws don't come from God. They come from Moses, who was a man, okay? And they were written because the Jewish people couldn't handle themselves, okay? Um, And so, but God only gave Ten Commandments. That's all it was, all right? And Jesus gives us eight Beatitudes to shoot after, okay? So it's, 
this idea, though, that Satan gives us that he thinks that, you know, this idea of dominion is control, right? But in really, God reigning over our nation is more like guidance. He guides us. He gives us certain principles and frameworks to work by. Certain principles that we should not break. Because once you break these principles you actually create a house of cards, okay? He's not the one that's going to say, you know, you have to not laugh. You have to have a haircut like this, okay? No, he gives guiding principles like thou shalt not kill. Well, that's kind of important, right? If a nation starts killing other people, then how can you trust the other people, right? You know, thou shalt not lie. Again, bad trust. You know, people lie. How can you trust them? You know, commit adultery. Why? Because you are vowed to love someone. The greatest power is love. And the greatest way to trust someone is through love. But, and where is that love expressed fully and greatly here on earth? Through marriage. And now you commit adultery and you've destroyed the most important trusting way of a relationship, which is love. Literally, you destroy the heart of trust. And so we have to understand that God's principles and guidance are there as a framework, not as a dominance. And our, and when God rules a nation, that nation will use those guidance and framework and principles to guide its laws so that trust can be built in a nation, that peace can true, true peace can reign, right? Anarchy leads to unrest. That's basically what it has. And a nation who has a, a, is a license, okay, leads to anarchy, right? So, Guidance and dominion, but but Satan wants to think, want to make you believe that Christ by dom that by having dominion and rule, he's going to dominate like some kind of, you know, uh, Kim Il Sung or something like that from North Korea or some kind of Machiavellian uh, person, and that is not the truth. The next is framework versus control. If you look at nations in which they kick God out, they become controlling. They become completely, completely controlling, okay? Like North Korea, like communist countries, like socialistic countries, all right? But conversely, in America, where we have complete license or we're falling in that trap, there's nothing to guide us. We're out of control, in essence. But where do we meet in the middle? In a framework, a framework where we create boundaries. We have the freedom to play in the playground, but we have the protection of the boundaries. Okay? If you look at relationships that fall apart, the first thing you'll notice is the destruction of boundaries. That's what it is. Destruction of boundaries. So God understands that we want freedom. And so he gives us a framework. The Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes are great frameworks. That's what they are, okay? So, but Satan would want us to believe that God is controlling, that he wants us to be controlled, and it's not. Real freedom is found within a boundary where you can play knowing that you're safe because the evil is protected by the fences, the fences that keep evil out and keep good people in, you know? So that's what it is. So having God rule and dominate creates a framework that allows, that protects us from too much control and not enough control. There's this idea of a benevolent king versus a despot, right? See, so would want to believe, make you believe that Jesus, by being king and ruler of not just you personally, but as well as this nation, he would be a despot, 
right? He's no fun. But he's actually a benevolent king, a gentle, guiding king. And so in the end, what has happened? Pride sets in. This is the one th- this is why humility is important. Because what happens is that, you know, we Satan instigates our pride. And that pride is like glasses, you know. I wear glasses and I can't see without glasses. But if I wore distorted glasses, then I still would not be able to see that well. So what Satan does is he instigates our pride so that we put on, instead of good glasses, distorted glasses. And those distorted glasses view God as controlling, domineering, Machiavellian, a despot. When in reality, he's not. He's really a benevolent king, providing a framework and guiding countries so that we can really have true freedom. Freedom to trust. Now, how does this relate to my son's career and North Korea? Well, you see, we talk about this far right and far left. The far right being controlling, far right being uh, Machiavellian and despotic. And we talk about the far left, which America is. America fell on, uh, falls underneath this far left license where there is no control, where we can do whatever we want mentality. And so the commonality between the two is that Christ needs to rule so that communism can become more balanced and democracy can be more balanced, which leads to my son's uh, my conversation with my son and his career. I was talking to him because I, he was talking about his career and, you know, uh, he wants to graduate in three years and become a computer science and he was trying to look at an internship at IBM. And so we were talking and, um, and he said, you know, Dad, he goes, I don't want to just be a programmer. I want to rise to the top and become, you know, maybe an executive and stuff. And so I, I kind of talked to him about being an executive and, you know, as an owner of a business and, you know, a well-thriving business, I rub elbows with executives. And I know the trap of being an executive. I'm going to tell this story, and I love telling this story. I met this man in prison ministry, and, um, you know, he just looked like any other uh, older gentleman. And But every time he would talk, he would uh, kind of allow his personal life to, you know, personal side kind of open up. And one day he said, yeah, I um, I won't be able to go to prison ministry um, in the next couple of weeks because I will be in the Caymans at my, I think it was his daughter's wedding. And I'm thinking to myself, Caymans, you know, wedding in the Caymans. So I I asked him, I said, you know, it's, you must have some money, you know, to to have um, a wedding in Caymans. And he goes, yeah, I, I, I have some money. And I said, well, what, what did you do? And come to find out, he was a, an executive. Now, I had a conversation with him in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, he, he was a high executive. I, I mean, a very extremely high executive. I, I believe he was CEO. And he, at that time, he actually was about to become CEO of even larger. I think it was even GE. GE was trying to recruit him to become CEO of GE. And, um, you know, and that was his career path. He was in his, uh, like, like early sixties at the time. And which is kind of like an, um, it's like the, the perfect time to be an executive in the sixties. It's, uh, it's a, uh, it's a great, you're not too young. You're not too old. It's uh, a very good, uh, it's, it's what they called the prime years. Okay. And so he was telling me the story that uh, as CEO, he invited over his vice presidents to his house for a dinner. And they were having dinner. And as the last vice president left the door, he shuts the door and he looks at his wife and he says, did you notice that? And his wife said, notice what? He goes, all the vice presidents there were on their third wives and all of them were half their age. 
because most vice presidents at that time were about in their 50s, their wives were in their mid-20s, and they were the third wives. So, you know, I shared that with my, my son um, as he was talking about his career and where he wanted to go and become executive. I said to him, one of the, and, and, and this, this is also a study, they, they noticed that executives have an issue where this freedom is abused, this power is abused, which leads to this type of behavior. You know, marriage fails and they go to the next and, and next. And it's because if Christ does not rule in even a business or in a nation or in your heart, freedom becomes license. And license allows us to say, I'm going to give up on my wife and throw her away for the next prettier person. And that's exactly what these people were doing. They were giving, getting... Um, giving up on their wives and going for the next younger woman. That is the commonality. The commonality between North Korea and my son's career in America is not making Christ truly king over the nation, over your heart. And if that happens, if you're a socialist and a communist, you'll become controlling, Machiavellian, if you are democracy, you will become a license. Why? Because we have this idea that somehow democracy of in itself must be a good thing. And it's not. Democracy of in itself is not good nor bad. It's neutral. That's what it is. You know, because we think that by nature, if a, if a nation that is, you know, creates, if the people, it creates its own laws, that all of a sudden those laws are going to be good. And that is not true. That is not true at all. You only need to look at the witch hunts in Massachusetts. You only need to see mob, uh, mob riots that occur you know, majority is not always right. Majority vote does not mean that they're going to create laws that are helpful. Only true guidance from a benevolent king we call Christ gives us the framework in which we can then um, use to create our laws and know that they will be good laws. But if not, if you throw God out the door, a democracy that, that allows people to create their own laws will create laws that will become license, allowing marijuana and allowing recreational drugs. This is what we're going down, allowing people to kill the child inside their womb, promoting um, irregularities of sexuality, legalizing same-sex marriage and recognizing as marriages when they're not. These are the things that happens. So democracy of in itself is not, you know, some kind of true answer. And here in America, we believe that. We think that's what it is. Oh, my goodness. That country, they're not, they're not uh, democratic. They, they don't have freedom. No. True freedom is found when Christ rules that nation. So it is important to recognize that we must make America, to make America great is not just, you know, voting Trump in. It's actually voting God into our country, making Christ king and ruler of our nation, to make him our king. And for America to become a Catholic nation. In conclusion, the fundamental basis of a society is trust. You know, look at any dollar, look at any coin, and what does this say? In God we trust. In God we trust. Why? Because why would, do why would money have to say that? 
Because what is money? It's a piece of paper. It's a piece of metal. And why would I have? To, why do I have to believe that this piece of paper that has a one or a five or a ten or a hundred? Why do I have to believe that is worth anything? Right? Well, I have to trust it. But the ultimate trust comes from God. Right? That's what it comes from. So that's why it's written in God we trust. All right? The, um, a, having Christ rule creates a stable guidance and regulations. God gives us frameworks and guidance so that we can then derive our laws, our regulations based off of that. If not, they could be complete license. License to be Machiavellian and controlling or license to allow people to do what is evil. And lastly, and most importantly, when Christ rules as a nation, as a king, in our personal life as well as a nation, it gives us ultimate purpose and meaning to life's action and materials. That's what it does. It gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. A nation that has meaning will be very productive. A person who has meaning and um, in their lives and purpose in their lives will always work with meaning and purpose in their actions. So this is the reason why Christ needs to rule. This is the tie between North Korea and my son's career. If my son's career is not dominated by Christ the King, then anything he does could be pure license. I can do whatever I want because no one sees what I do. And there are no rules. I can divorce my wife and remarry. I can do all these things that I want to do. Now, I'm not saying that you should be married because of, uh, you know, going to hell. But you will find purpose of marriage when Christ reigns in your marriage. You will find meaning in your marriage if Christ rules in your marriage. You will find purpose for work and for uh, material goods if Christ reigns at work. You will find purpose and meaning of a country and patriotism if Christ reigns and rules in a nation. And you will find, you know, guidance and what to do in situations that might not always be the best. And ultimately, if you don't make God ruler of the nation, ruler of your lives, you're going to make something else and replace it. And that something else will be another person to abuse, that will abuse you. That's what happens. So either Christ rules you're going to have a Machiavellian leader ruling over you. And that leader might be an oligarchy, a monarchy. It's going to be some entity, and it's going to be man. And when that happens, then we're all in trouble. I'd like to leave you with the final words of Maccabees, okay? And uh, it says here, while... She was still speaking. The young man said, this was the the last young man who was a martyr. What are you waiting for? I will not obey the king's command, who the king is acting like a god, but I obey the command of the law that was given to our fathers through Moses. In other words, um, and he says, he continues, but you who have contrived all sorts of evil against the Hebrews will certainly not escape the hands of God. For we are suffering because of our own sins. And if our living Lord is angry for a little while to rebuke and discipline us, he will again be reconciled with his own servants. But you, unholy wretch, you most defiled of all men, do not be elated in vain and puffed up by certain hopes. When you raise your hand against the children of heaven... 
you have not es- yet escaped the judgment of the Almighty, all-seeing God. For our brothers, after enduring a brief suffering, have drunk of o- ever-flowing life under God's covenant. But you, by the judgment of God, will receive just punishment for your arrogance. I, like my brother, give up body and life for the laws of our fathers, appealing to God to show mercy soon to our nation and by afflicting afflictions and plagues to make you confess that he alone is God and through me and my brothers to bring to an end the wrath of Almighty which has justly fallen on our whole nation. In other words, he's saying is this. Ultimately, I am doing God's will and you're not. I will go to heaven and you will not. So Christ rules That's what we have to understand. And without him ruling, we are all going to be destroyed. So let's end it with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you with all our hearts. We know that you love us. That you want to be our benevolent king, guiding us, giving us frameworks for us to play in this wonderful world that you've given us. Help us to always have you rule, not only in our hearts, but in our lives, in our businesses, in where we work, and where our nation belongs. Rule over our, our country, the United States. Rule over all countries so that peace, true peace and trust can be brought about. As we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thanks for listening to me, David Cease at Practical Catholic. Here's a reflection for you. Take a moment and reflect. Is Christ truly king over my life, and do I want him to reign in my world? Feel free to share your reflection or leave a comment on the podcast, Instagram, and Facebook at Practical Catholic, or visit my webpage at practicalcatholic1, that is the number one, dot com. You're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom.